Hi there, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, and welcome to the next edition of our Disease Education Webinar Series. I'm so excited today that we'll be talking about pulmonary hypertension in interstitial lung disease. And this is such a timely topic. Um, we're gonna be hearing from two experts in this area, and I will um, introduce them and then I'll give you a few housekeeping notes before I let them get started. So first we have Dr. Bridget Collins. She's the Director of Interstitial Lung Disease Education for the Center of Interstitial Lung Disease at the University of Washington in Seattle. She specializes in the diagnosis and management of patients with ILD and she enjoys teaching patients and medical trainees in both the clinic and inpatient settings as um, well as in um, more formal settings. And then second up, we have Dr. Namada Sud. She is the Director of Advanced Lung Disease at UC Davis. And her focus is on pulmonary vascular disease, and that includes pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary embolism, and lung disease related to rheumatologic disease and sickle cell anemia. Um, so I'm so excited that we have you two here today. Thank you so much for being here. It's gonna be a wonderful discussion. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes if you haven't joined our webinars before. If you look at your control panel, um, usually that's on the right of your screen. You can, um, if you're having any technical difficulties, drop down the chat box there and send us any messages and we'll try to help you um, troubleshoot those if you're having trouble. Throughout the um, talks today, um, feel free to submit any questions. Those will be in the questions tab on the control panel. If you'll drop that down, you can put your questions in. We will save those questions for the time we have at the end, um, but please, you can put them in that box anytime during the, um, during the talks today. And if you are interested in downloading the slides, we have those in PDF under the handouts tab on the control panel. Um, so those are there. You can go ahead and download them at any time during our, during our session today. And finally, if you will stay with us um, through the end of um, our session and past it, uh, you will have an opportunity to fill out a bit of a survey and give us some feedback on our session today and help us craft our future webinars um, and, uh, and guide what we talk about then. So without any further ado, I am going to turn my camera off and hand it over first to Dr. Bridget Collins. Thank you so much for being here. Great, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm gonna get started with talking about sort of part one here, um, which is definition and diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, and then Dr. Sood will talk about management. No disclosures, and then I have a medical disclaimer slide. So basically any information is informational or educational, not a substitute for um, medical advice. So today in the first part of the talk, I'm going to cover a definition of pulmonary hypertension. We'll talk about why it happens in patients with interstitial lung disease. We'll review signs and symptoms, and then we'll talk a little bit about evaluation. Off the bat, I'll note that there are more than 200 different um, interstitial lung diseases, so inflammation and or scarring in the lungs from a variety of causes. And some of the, the big groups we think about here include the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, such as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, unclassifiable disease, so no clear diagnosis, even though it's you've been seen at an expert center, and then other diseases such as sarcoidosis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, autoimmune interstitial lung disease, just a, a multitude of different um, diseases. And I just want to call this out just to highlight that we're not only talking about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis here. Is a bit of a review in terms of thinking about physiology in the lung. So on the left of the screen here, there's a healthy lung. You can see the airway, the bronchiole, and these little round air sacs, the alveoli. So what happens is oxygen goes from the alveolus, the air sac, across tissue, which is the interstitium, and then into the blood vessels. On the right, this is um, a drawing of someone with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, where you can see there's a thicker kind of scarred interstitium there. And so it's harder for oxygen um, to transfer. 
Over here on the right, this is just a slide showing a normal lung in A. You can see these very nice, beautiful air sacs, and then a lung in pulmonary fibrosis. And so just to highlight what we findings we often see are restriction, meaning the lungs don't open as well as they should. Um, and then we can also see gas exchange impaired. In thinking about pulmonary hypertension, it's important to understand the physiology of the lungs. And so I just wanna review that first. So basically blood comes from your body to the right side of your heart, your right ventricle. And then it's pumped through the pulmonary arteries into your lungs. In your lungs, it picks up oxygen, which is at the level of the alveolus here. You see the air sac in the small capillary blood vessels. And then the oxygenated blood goes back through the pulmonary veins into the left side of your heart and is pumped back out to your body. And then the oxygen rich blood goes around, feeds your organs and tissues, and then comes back oxygen poor to start the cycle again. It's important to just note that the pulmonary circulation is different than the systemic circulation. So your pulmonary circulation, the blood vessels in your lungs are low resistance or low pressure and high compliance. Normally, when we're just sitting here, we're pumping, our heart's pumping about five liters of blood per minute through our body. But when we exercise, this can increase to 20 or 25 liters a minute. And so the vessels in the lung have to be able to dilate and comply to accept that higher load of blood flow. In contrast, in the systemic circulation, what we measure in the arms, for instance, it's high resistance, high pressure, because you want that blood to get kind of pushed back to your heart to go through the circuit. So pulmonary hypertension refers to high blood pressure in the lungs, so the vessels of the lungs, the pulmonary circulation. And it's really important to note that that's independent of what we measure in the arm. So you can have low, normal, or high blood pressure in the arm, and that doesn't really give us clues about if you have pulmonary hypertension or not, sort of two different, um, two different circulations that we're looking at. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the causes of pulmonary hypertension. Today, we're gonna focus here, this is from um, an Australian registry, but basically kind of going through the causes, but it's important to have an understanding of this because even though one has interstitial lung disease and or pulmonary fibrosis, you can still have other things too um, that can cause trouble and it's important to make sure we're looking at the entire picture. In general, most pulmonary hypertension is related to left-sided heart disease. Um, so heart failure, valve problems, where essentially the blood just kind of backs up from the left side of the heart and raises the pressures of the lungs. About 10% is related to lung disease or sleep disordered breathing, low oxygen levels. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is about 3% and that can be idiopathic, meaning unknown cause, or we see it with some autoimmune diseases. Chronic thromboembolic disease is blood clots. I'm just kind of clogging up the vessels that feed the lungs. And then some are unknown. The World Health Organization has made different classes of pulmonary hypertension, the goal of which is to help guide treatment. So I'm going to go through the classes here because it matters when we're thinking about treatment. So group one pulmonary arterial hypertension is sometimes inherited. It can be related to toxins such as methamphetamine use or back um, when folks used to use fenfen. Um, it can be associated with autoimmune diseases as well, like scleroderma. You can see over here this just dilated, or not dilated, excuse me, this like really just thick walls of this vessel here, um, which would make it harder for the blood to pass through. Group two is left heart disease. So this is either your left heart is really stiff or it's dilated and blood just kind of backs up into the lungs. It can also happen if there's problems with the valves between the different chambers of the heart. 
Group three, is that related to low oxygen levels, interstitial lung disease? So when there's thickening of the space between the air sacs and the blood vessels, um, that can do it, or emphysema, where the air sacs are very floppy, you kind of lose the number of blood vessels you have in circuit. Can also happen with sleep disordered breathing, sleep apnea, and chronic low oxygen levels. And then thromboembolic, WHO group four, just blood clots blocking the vessels. And then group five includes disorders such as sarcoidosis, um, lymphangioliomyomatosis, or LAM, which is a cystic lung disease. And in these disorders, we don't know what causes pulmonary hypertension. So in group one, the first group, this is an important group because there are some patients with autoimmune disease, so for instance, scleroderma, where they have some scarring in their lungs, but they could still fall into this group one. Um, and I'll go through each of the groups in sequence. But basically in group one, the artery gets thick. There's all of this proliferation of cells and factors. This is my very simple depiction, different than the sophisticated picture here, but basically um, there's just all of this thickening and organization remodeling um, in the wall of the vessel, and so it's harder to push the blood through. In WHO group two, which is the most common cause of pulmonary hypertension, the blood is kind of backing up from the left side of the heart, and this increases wall stress, and so the vessels are just dilated and overfilled, and so the pressures are higher. In group three, which is what we're most often looking at in interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, I think the easiest way to think about this is you're missing blood vessels. So there's scarring in the lungs or inflammation, and so we lose some of the blood vessels that are sort of in the circuit, and so when there's fewer vessels in the circuit, the pressure across each one is going to be higher. Also, with chronic low oxygen levels, the blood vessels in the lungs constrict. They don't like it. Um, and if you have chronic hypoxemia or low oxygen that's sustained or it's recurrent, that can sometimes lead to remodeling um, in the blood vessel walls as well. So group three, which I just described, includes PHILD. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is the most often studied, as is often the case. Um, looking at studies, there's a very broad range of the frequency of pulmonary um, hypertension across these patients, so three to 86 percent. Um, in one study looking at initial or kind of time of first presentation, it was present in about 15% of patients, about 40 to 50% as disease became more advanced, and then in more than 60% of patients at the end stages of disease. We know that when pulmonary fibrosis or scarring is combined with emphysema, so the kind of floppy air sacs, those folks, um, up to half of them will have pulmonary hypertension. When pulmonary hypertension is present with the interstitial lung disease, it's associated with higher risk for death, um, worse functional capacity, and often increased oxygen requirement. It's um, important to note that even though we know pulmonary hypertension becomes more common among patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as their disease worsens, that the presence of pulmonary hypertension doesn't always track with the severity of lung disease. So you could have relatively mild interstitial lung disease, but still have pulmonary hypertension. And actually in studies of lung tissue um, of people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, they see some blood vessel changes in the normal parts of the lung, suggesting that it's not just the scarred areas that are causing the problem. There's other kind of hormones and proteins released that, that stimulate vascular remodeling. And again, this is a normal lung up here and then a lung with, with scarring here, all of this pink in the tissue. WHO group four, is increased um, resistance in the vessel because of blood clots. And this is, again, important um, for this group because patients with 
many types of pulmonary fibrosis, particularly autoimmune disease, have higher risk of blood clots. And so even though you have interstitial lung disease and that could contribute to pulmonary hypertension, this is always something that's important to keep in mind. And then group five, we don't know the mechanism um, of, what, of what causes it. Over time, um, what happens as the pressures in the lungs get higher? So here the pressures in the lungs are only mildly elevated and the circle is around the right ventricle of the heart. And you can see the right ventricle is smaller than the left ventricle next door. However, as the pressures in the lungs increase, more blood can, it goes back to that right ventricle and it gets dilated. And as that happens, your left ventricle, which should be the bigger ventricle, gets compressed. And that leads to kind of less blood being available to go out to your body to circulate. And so as time goes on, this is sort of the process that we're looking at. A bit more um, about frequency of pulmonary hypertension in ILD. Um, again, many studies in IPF um, one study looking at patients when they were getting evaluated for lung transplant found that about 40% had pulmonary hypertension initially, whereas 86% had pulmonary hypertension when they got their transplant. I noted here that this is measured by right heart catheterization, which I'm going to talk more about because that's really important when you're diagnosing pulmonary hypertension. There was a study of patients with fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is scarring in the lungs related to things in the environment like molds or birds. And they found about 30 to 50% of folks had pulmonary hypertension. Um, there have been a couple studies, one in nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, which is another pattern that we see where similarly, I think about 40% of patients had pulmonary hypertension. It's important just to note that the definition or how we make a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension changed a few years ago. And so the reports vary in these different studies in part because people use different definitions and then the definition has changed over time. Common signs and symptoms of pulmonary hypertension include shortness of breath with exertion, fatigue, weakness, chest discomfort, lightheadedness, syncope, which is fainting. You can get fluid retention. So as that right side of your heart dilates, you know, blood flow is kind of backing up and then that can further back up and lead to extra fluid in your abdomen or your legs and then coughing. I put stars by chest discomfort and the syncope or fainting because those are often kind of red flag symptoms that should push you to go to the emergency room. The problem is that there are other things that can cause these symptoms too. So the interstitial lung disease itself, a blood clot, you could have a pneumonia, you could have asthma in addition to interstitial lung disease, coronary artery disease, so like heart attack, um, plaques in the, the arteries feeding your heart. Um, can sometimes cause shortness of breath without a lot of chest discomfort. And so it's important um, just to think about all of these different causes when we as providers are evaluating folks um, presenting. How do we evaluate people for pulmonary hypertension? So, you know, in interstitial lung disease clinic, how do I approach this? So, we do um, a good amount of six minute walk tests where you walk in the hall for six minutes and we measure your oxygen levels and your heart rate and how short of breath you are. And there can be some clues on there that make me think more about pulmonary hypertension. So normally when you walk, your heart rate goes up because your heart's working a bit harder to kind of feed all those moving tissues. But if your heart rate goes up and is staying up and not coming back down, that makes me worry a bit about pulmonary hypertension. There are certain um, parameters on lung function testing that can give us a clue. Sometimes blood work, there's something called the, a brain natriuretic peptide or BNP, which I think about this in a simple way. I think of it as a protein 
that's released from the heart when it's under stretch from too much fluid. And so this can be elevated in pulmonary hypertension, but can also be increased for other reasons. I just often use it as sort of part of the puzzle. On CAT scan, um, the pulmonary artery, which is shown here, the branching vessel, I think you can hopefully see my arrow. Um, if that's larger than the neighboring aorta, that's a clue that we should look for pulmonary hypertension. And then echocardiogram and right heart catheterization are two other important tests, and I'm gonna go through each of those in a bit of detail. Echocardiogram is just an ultrasound probe on your chest, and it uses high frequency sound waves to create pictures of the heart chambers. So we can measure the different chambers of the heart. We can look at how, how high pressures are and how blood is moving across different valves of the heart. And these measurements give us a picture of blood pressure and flow in the heart in those large vessels feeding it, but they don't give us a definitive diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. But we do often use echocardiogram as a first step or a screening mm -hmm. test. To truly um, make a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, right heart catheterization is the gold standard. This is a same day procedure. Um, they thread a small catheter through a blood vessel in your neck or your wrist or your groin and thread that through the heart into the pulmonary artery and can actually measure the pressures and can say, do you have pulmonary hypertension? If so, how severe is it? Sometimes during um, the catheterization, you'll get nitric oxide or IV fluid. So the person doing the catheter can look at your response to that and how your blood vessels and heart respond, because that can give us some clues to the cause of pulmonary hypertension or how you may respond to therapy. The actual procedure itself is usually less than one hour. Definitions of pulmonary hypertension for diagnosis and then also what are typically used in studies are based on the data from the right heart catheterization. So what happens, and I have a little map over here, is that we can measure the pressure in the right side of the heart, the right atrium, the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery, and then inflate a balloon that creates sort of a column of fluid to the left side of the heart so we can measure the pressures there too. And then we take all of those values and figure out the mean pulmonary arterial pressure um, and also something called your pulmonary vascular resistance, um, which is basically the change in pressure from your pulmonary artery to your left heart divided by your cardiac output. Um, and then there's criteria, so mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than or equal to 20 with a pulmonary vascular resistance greater than or equal to three. I wouldn't expect anyone to memorize these, but these are kind of the two of the big numbers that we're looking for when we do a right heart catheterization. And then this wedge pressure where we're able to measure the pressures in the left side of the heart is really important in telling us if there's a left heart component or not. Um, because also people can have more than one thing, right? You could have interstitial lung disease and some pulmonary hypertension associated with that and have heart failure and have high pressures on that left side. So that kind of helps us distinguish. Other tests that might be involved in evaluation um, after we, we make a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. So there's something called a VQ scan, which is a, a study in radiology that looks for chronic blood clots blocking the vessels of the lungs and increasing pressure. Sometimes you'll need to have your left heart checked out with a stress test or what's called a left heart catheterization where they go through on the arterial side with a catheter and look at the vessels feeding the heart itself. Sleep study, sleep apnea is common and is more frequent among patients with certain types of pulmonary fibrosis. Untreated sleep apnea is associated with pulmonary hypertension, so you may need a sleep study to evaluate for that. We sometimes check out your liver with blood tests or an ultrasound, and then we may do other blood tests as well. For instance, if you have pulmonary fibrosis, let's say you have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, 
and now you have pretty significant pulmonary hypertension, your doctor may, or provider may want to update autoimmune disease labs, just make sure there's nothing else going on. In terms of monitoring folks for pulmonary hypertension, really attending your regular clinic visits and checkups for your lung disease can help monitor because we do test like the lung function test and the six minute walk test. And of course the physical exam is part of your usual care for interstitial lung disease. There was recently um, a study published looking at um, surveyed pulmonary hypertension interstitial lung disease experts and they um sorry some question um and they asked what signs triggered them to most think about pulmonary hypertension so um on history any fainting dizziness blood clot history um if someone starts having swelling in their legs or ascites which is swelling in the abdomen we will sometimes look at your neck vein, your jugulus, jugular venous pressure, because when there's backup of fluid and pressure on the right side of your heart, we can see that vein go up as well. It's almost like a, like a dipstick. Um, six minute walk test if the distance drops off, um, chest CT scan, whenever we do that to look at the interstitial lung disease, we're also looking at how the right heart looks, how the pulmonary artery looks, and then lung function testing. And I wanted to just spend one minute on this. So lung function testing, one of the things we're often looking for is a very low diffusion capacity that's out of proportion to your forced vital capacity. So your forced vital capacity is the part of the test where we say, take a deep breath in, blast it all out. And that gives us a sense of how much, if there's restriction of the lungs opening and how severe. The diffusion capacity is the maneuver that's done last with the breath hold for 10 seconds. And essentially that measures the surface area that's available in the lung for, for gas exchange. And so with pulmonary hypertension, there's sometimes less flow going through because um, the vessels are constricted and hypertrophied, the vessels could be thickened. Um, and so you can have a, a low diffusion very low diffusion capacity sometimes out of proportion to your forced vital capacity. And that, so seeing that on a lung function test may just trigger your doctor to think a little bit more about pulmonary hypertension. So for this um, segment of the talk, just summary points, that pulmonary hypertension means there's high blood pressure in the vessels feeding the lungs. There are different causes of pulmonary hypertension. Interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis are one cause, but it's important to think about the other causes as well to make sure that we're not missing something. Symptoms can be similar to pulmonary fibrosis, which makes it tricky. Um, and so it's important to follow regularly with your lung doctor and I think just paying attention to, to change in symptoms or new symptoms. Echocardiogram is a screening test, but you really need that right heart catheterization for definitive diagnosis. My screen, Bridget? Not yes, yet. I can see it. You can. Okay, so I just need to get out of here. And then I'll be. Okay, all right, we're on. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Collins, for that excellent introduction. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is talk about how do we manage pulmonary hypertension when it occurs in the setting of interstitial lung disease. These are my disclosures. So, um, so as you already heard, that the um, uh, that there can be many symptoms associated with pulmonary hypertension and the treatment of pulmonary hypertension needs a stepwise approach to the management. And sometimes these symptoms are hard to separate uh, because uh, the interstitial lung disease itself causes shortness of breath, reduced exercise tolerance, causes these, uh, you know, drop in the oxygen saturations with activity, lightheadedness and leg, leg, leg edema. So the first step for the physician is to separate out what is causing these symptoms. Is it just the interstitial lung disease or there is pulmonary hypertension occurring in conjunction? And as you already heard, there's certain 
clues that the doctor may have that might trigger the evaluation for pulmonary hypertension, which include worsening shortness of breath, but no change in the pulmonary function test, so CT scan, higher oxygen requirement, a low DLCO on the, the PFTs, and then low walk distance or leg swelling. And as Dr. Collins already mentioned, the first thing is that we need to identify what is the underlying lung disease so that we can first appropriately treat that before we kind of uh, work towards um, treating the pulmonary hypertension. So it's very important that we have a clear diagnosis of what the interstitial lung disease is and if, it is, uh, if you're on the appropriate treatment for that. And the, the problem is, as you saw uh, I, earlier, that it is those little wind sacs where the problem is. So in interstitial lung disease, that, that, trend, that uh, membrane that exchanges the gas in the lung is thickened, and that's where the vessels are. So the vessels also get damaged. And really the job is what is, what is really causing the problem here. And the many, many different things that cause the pressures in the lungs to go up, as you already heard, some of the pressures may be backing off if people have problems with the left heart disease, or if people have sleep apnea that is not treated, that can cause these vessels to tighten up as well. So it's very important that we kind of identify other reasons why the pressures in the lungs could be going up. And we absolutely need a right heart catheterization to make that diagnosis. We cannot make the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension with any degree of confidence without actually going in and measuring the pressures and making sure that all the pressure that we are seeing in the lung is coming from the lung and not backing off from the left side of the heart. So here, let's go to the oxygen, go back one. Just, okay, so, all right, so we start again. <laughs> So we so first important thing in the management is we know that low oxygen causes pulmonary vessels to tighten up and that itself then causes the pressure to go up. So as part of the management of the interstitial lung disease, it's important to use the oxygen as prescribed because uh, otherwise we will falsely diagnose pulmonary hypertension. Next slide. And then it's also very important to control the blood pressure. So if you have systemic hypertension and the pressures are high, that also leads to high pressures within the lungs. So we want to control that well. And if there is a diagnosis of sleep apnea, it needs to be uh, treated and addressed before we go on to more specific treatments for pulmonary hypertension. Next slide. So over the years, they've been since uh, 1996, we've had several medications that have been approved for pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, most of those study, uh, uh, drugs have been looked at in patients who do not have lung disease. We, do, we have never included patients with lung disease, uh, interstitial lung disease in the studies and so forth. And most of those therapies have not shown to be of benefit in the setting of interstitial lung disease. However, there's some newer therapies which are inhaled, so they go into the lung and deliver where the lung is actually getting the oxygen and kind of work on the vessels there and they have shown to be benefits. So there are two uh, therapies that we are looking at very carefully now. So next slide. So first is the inhaled triposnil. Uh, it is a prostacycline analog. Uh, so prostacycline is normally present in the lungs and it causes the vessels to open up, prevents them from getting thick and damaged. And it's, so it's a very potent vasodilator and it has a short half-life of about two to four hours. So when you take it, it lasts in the, uh, it sort of lasts in the system for about six hours and then it kind of is gone. Next slide. And the delivery system we have for it is a, neb a nebulizer now. So the patients basically fill, uh, fill this up in the morning with the medication, and then they take uh, treatments and they start with one breath four times a day. And then gradually as they get used to the drug, every week we increase it and then we try to get them at least up to nine uh, breaths four times a day. So they have to do the treatment kind of spaced out at least four hours apart, if not six hours apart, and take it four times a day. With that, we can have a steady level of the drug in the body. Next slide. 
And this uh, drug was studied in uh, 326 patients who had interstitial lung disease. Half of them got the medication, half of them got placebo, and they were followed for about 16 weeks. And the first sort of number we looked at is, did they improve their walk test? So the whole walk test, did that improve or no? And we can see that they're clearly patients who had, uh, who received the inhaled troposinol did much better than those who did not get the drug at all. Next slide. The other things we looked at were other markers of pulmonary hypertension, as Dr. Collins mentioned, that BNP, which is a reflection of the stretch in the heart. In patients who received the treatment, those numbers went down, which is a good thing. And also we looked at other things, like did patients uh, get hospitalized? And we saw that the patients who had uh, received treatment had less reasons to get into the hospital. Their walk improved um, and uh, there was, um, some of them went on to transplant regardless. And so clearly this drug seemed to be of benefit in patients who had pulmonary hypertension related to interstitial lung disease. Next slide. And what were the side effects? There's always downsides to any uh, treatment. The biggest one was cough. Now cough is already a big problem in patients with interstitial lung disease. And then because this um, medication opens up the vessels, a lot of patients got headaches, and then um, some felt short of breath with the treatments and occasionally uh, dizziness and um, sometimes nausea, but that wasn't any different in the two groups. And throat irritation is quite common. Next slide. But when we look at the data a little bit closely and we try to sort of make sense of which were the patients who truly benefited from this medication, um, we noticed that there were certain things here. And as Dr. Collins pointed out, the patients who were sicker, right? The patients who tended to have higher pulmonary artery pressures or higher resistance, they tend to get a greater benefit from the medication. So it is so important that we uh, sort of uh, you know, address the other issues, then measure the pressures, and then carefully pick the patients who will benefit from the medication. And then patients really needed to get on to a certain dose before they noted the benefit. So all the dots on the right suggest that there was benefit of the medication. All the dots on the left suggest that there wasn't really that much benefit of the medication. And you see that the patients who got to nine, over nine puffs did better than those who remained below because of side effects. And those who were had a higher pressure tend to great, get better, greater benefit of the medication. Next slide. So the way we do this is we carefully sort of evaluate the patient, make sure the interstitial lung disease is uh, addressed, make sure their oxygen levels, the sleep apnea, everything is treated. And then we start them on a low dose of inhalation uh, at one to two inhalations four times a day and slowly increase that. Uh, once per week till we get to the maximum dose that the patient is tolerated. I work very hard to make sure the patients at least get to eight to nine puffs four times a day. Some of them are doing 12 puffs four times a day. Cough is the commonest problem, uh, throat irritation and pain, headache and nausea. A lot of these side effects will settle down as patients use the medication and also as we work on the technique and some tools like uh, uh, taking some peanut butter, wetting the throat, or some honey before taking the treatment. So, but some patients are still unable to tolerate it. Next slide. And then there is another one that we're looking at. It's, it's still in clinical trials. So nitric oxide is a, is a very potent vasodilator. It's naturally present in our system and it prevents the, it keep, maintains the health of the vessels. And as P, uh, people develop pulmonary hypertension, the levels of nitric oxide reduced in the body. So this is the delivery system. This is a canister that uh, um, is nitric oxide and it's delivered by the nasal cannula. This clinical trial is hopefully we will be able to get some results um, at the end of the next year. And this uh, medication overall has minimal uh, side effects, but of course we have to see yet whether it's a benefit and how well it tol was tolerated and so forth. Next slide. And there are many, many, as I mentioned, the many, many therapies of uh, pulmonary hypertension that are available in the market, like sildenafil, tadalafil, riosigwat, then the ERAs, which is embrisentin, bosentin, macetentin, and then other ways to deliver troposinols uh, and then uh, prostacycline. 
they have not been shown to be of benefit in patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension related to interstitial lung disease. And now when people have, um, as Dr. Collins also mentioned, when people have uh, pulmonary hypertension in the setting of scleroderma, this might be a little bit more nuanced and they might, there could, could be a role of uh, these medications, but then again, that has to be decided by the doctor, but mostly they're not shown to be um, effective when, they're, uh, when the primary problem is interstitial lung disease. Next slide. Then there are the therapies that might be needed, uh, diuretics, if there is swelling, there's more, uh, more fluid on the body, then getting rid of that extra fluid lowers the pressures within the lungs. Oxygen, I've already mentioned, and pulmonary rehab, because we need the strong muscles to kind of uh, maintain that uh, sense of, uh, reduce the sense of shortness of breath. And also the exercise in itself helps the, the, the vessels, the heart. So if uh, always, once the, somebody's feeling better, well enough to do a little bit, we like to put them into a formal pulmonary rehab program so they can get further improvement in their symptoms. Next slide. Then there are other things because we have to maintain the whole health of the patient. Uh, vaccinations are strongly encouraged. The other important thing to re remember is to once you have interstitial lung disease and you have interstitial lung disease with pulmonary hypertension, your doctor needs to be in your business all the time, unfortunately. So if you're planning a travel, especially if you're planning to take a flight or go to high altitude, please let your doctor know because your oxygen prescription may need to be changed, even though you don't need oxygen at, um, at uh, sea level, uh, you might need it when you go on to an elevation. So we, you need to make arrangements for oxygen when uh, before you travel and then if you're going through airports and have those long distances it's always a good idea to arrange for a wheelchair so you don't get exhausted before you get to your destination next slide and um, and also these medications are hard uh, so if you're not able to tolerate the medications it's so important to get back to the doctor so they can work with you to find something that works for you rather than just uh, be worried about disappointing the physician and then uh, take out any other medications that get started should be uh, at least your pulmonary hypertension physician or your LD physician should be uh, made aware of that. And if there is a surgery that needs to happen, then the physicians need to be informed of that too, so they can talk to the anesthesiologist and make sure that uh, appropriate precautions are taken so you make it through that safely. Next slide. And then other things to avoid like constipation, excessive heat and hot weather. I already talked about high altitude. Pregnancy can be quite dangerous when people have pulmonary hypertension. So that's a discussion that has to be had with the doctor as well. Excessive alcohol, illicit drugs, certain medications on, on the streets are shown to cause pulmonary hypertension. So of course, those are absolutely a no. Over the counter decongestants, again, a discussion needs to be had with the doctor if it's safe and smoking. Uh, clear we don't want to damage the lungs any more than they already been hurt. Next slide. So overall, maintain balanced diet, maintain an ideal body weight, maintain modest exercise and activity level, adequate sleep. Um, it's important to manage anxiety, stress, or depression. I think it's very hard to go through both these illnesses without um, experiencing some level of each and, you know, uh, get your support system going or reach out for professional help and control the blood pressure. Next slide. And with that, um, I think a close sort of follow up with the physicians, constant communication, and I think we are hopeful in terms of more therapies coming down the pipeline to help this specific subset of patients. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to invite Dr. Collins to um, come back online with us too. And we have, we actually have a few minutes and we can um, hopefully get to a lot of your questions. We've got um, some great engagement here. So I'm going to actually kick this off kind of back to the beginning of the discussion and ask um, a, a question maybe two ways. And that is, do, do all patients with pulmonary fibrosis eventually, like they live long enough with it, are they gonna develop pulmonary hypertension? And, um, 
And I know you mentioned, um, Dr. Collins, that uh, it was maybe sometimes independent of the severity. So there doesn't, does it, there seem to be a point at which it gets so bad that you're gonna have pulmonary hypertension regardless or no, not so much. Yeah, so I will, I never say anything with 100% um, certainty because I'm never 100% certain of anything. I think that, you know, what we know from the patients with IPF, so in that one study, by the time they got a transplant, so very, very sick, you know, 86% had pulmonary hypertension. I would say as the disease advances, you're more likely to develop it, but it's not a guarantee. I have some patients with advanced pulmonary fibrosis who, you know, can't get a transplant or aren't getting a transplant who, you know, don't have pulmonary hypertension. So it's, it's, it's higher risk, but it's not a guarantee. Yeah. Um, a lot of patients can have very advanced uh, interstitial lung disease and never develop pulmonary hypertension. Absolutely. I think conversely, sometimes I've seen, you know, anecdotally patients that don't, don't have bad pulmonary fibrosis at all, particularly in patients with autoimmune interstitial lung disease, but they do have significant pulmonary hypertension. And I think that's a little bit of a different situation too. So I think um, just like you were saying, the workup is, is so important. So I'm going to yeah. use that and, anyway. <laughs> Go ahead. And even in, in patients with UIP, right, we had patients with less than 5% involvement on the CT scan uh, show evidence of pulmonary hypertension. So again, it's that sort of looking for it, being thoughtful, and then sort of getting a more detailed workup if it's suspected. Absolutely. Um, I have a question here about right heart catheterization. I think you both emphasize the importance of having a right heart catheterization in the diagnosis and workup because of all the different causes and the things that could be going on and severity and so on. Um, can you talk a little bit about, that's another procedure and it's a little bit invasive. Um, what are the risks with a right heart catheterization? Do you want me to take that? I don't, I don't yeah. perform right heart catheterization. Yeah. So, <laughs> it is, the procedure itself, I, I always joke with the patients, the hardest part of that procedure is getting yourself to the hospital, which is never a pleasant endeavor. Uh, but really, the procedure itself has gotten safer and safer, um, because now most of our right heart cats we are doing through the arm. We used to, basically, we have to go through a vein, and we uh, take a very fine catheter, and it just flows the way the blood normally flows. So we basically, you know, get into a vein, just a big fat IV, float the catheter through that, and it flows the way the blood normally flows from the veins into the right side of the heart, out into the lungs. And we park it there, we measure the pressures. But of course, nothing is 100% safe. But we used to go through the vein in the neck, or we used to use the vein in the leg. But now we're mostly using the vein in the arm. So it's pretty much become like just getting an IV for any other procedure. We don't use any dye, so there's no risk of that. And there is a small risk of kind of bruising and hurting the vein uh, in the arm, or sometimes occasionally uh, irritating the heart and causing it to be an, an, in, go into an abnormal rhythm. But we do it in such a controlled environment that we can always stop the procedure and prevent any badness from happening. And sometimes on very rare occasions, we might cause a rupture. But honestly, in 25 years of doing this, I have not seen it, touch wood. I might have jinxed myself here. But so it's really become a very safe procedure. And uh, and it is, it is a lot, especially when you can't breathe and the oxygen level is so low, it just takes, it's sort of feels very overwhelming. But for a lot of things that, uh, you know, we put our patients through this, is, it sounds terrible, but it's not the worst. That's great, thank you. We have a question about um, about the use of um, of oxygen. I hear this in my clinic too. I I've been prescribed oxygen. I told I told I should use it of X, Y, and Z. I don't like it. I feel okay without it. Am I going to raise my risk of getting pulmonary hypertension, Dr. Collins? Maybe I'll let you go first. Yeah, so this, you know, this definitely um, does come up. And I think whenever anyone starts oxygen, it's just like such a mental um, shift in how you think about yourself and your life. And so totally understand that. I also have, I would say probably once a clinic, a conversation that your oxygen levels don't always go with how you feel. So sometimes they're low and you're feeling okay. 
But I do worry that with chronic low oxygen levels that you'll get vascular remodeling and increased risk of pulmonary hypertension. And then I also worry just about chronically low oxygen levels and if the heart doesn't like it. <laughs> you know, I've had patients who've had abnormal heart rhythms. And so um, I, that is one of the things that I definitely worry about with chronic hypoxemia. Yep. And again, uh, when uh, I also feel that when you have interstitial lung disease and there's already limitation within the lung, then any sort of, you know, tightening of the vessels because 